dear students welcome to the class um, this is a continuation of the earlier lecture uh, earlier lecture of the poem a morning walk now here in this lecture i will read and analyze hymns in darkness now this poem hymns in darkness is you may say the title poem from the collection hymns in darkness which was published in 1976 and this volume is dedicated to kq and khorsed gandhi now uh, as this is a very long poem uh, i will not read the poem first but i will try to analyze the poem as i read the poem so let us start hymns in darkness he knows how to speak of humility without humility he has exchanged the wisdom of youthfulness for the follies of maturity what is lost is certain what is gained of dubious value self esteem stunts his growth he has not learned how to be nobody all his truths are outside him mock his activity the noise of the city is matched by the noise of his spirit now if you read the poem if you continue to read the poem you will understand that this is a poem which doesn't have any form so apparently a formless poem in the strictest sense of the term a poem without any form because initial long lines give way to shorter ones as the poem progresses you will find out i mean the last three line three or four lines comprise only a word each you will find that the last uh, stun a uh, last section of the poem uh, there are very short lines in the last section and the last four lines comprises only a single word slowly one by one couplets become triplet and such irregularities thematically also the poem draws on various aspects and what are those aspects man's position in the universe his religiosity mundane and humdrum reality of roads being tarred green leaves around dog seat crows pecking at the gutter breasts thighs buttocks and at, at times flashes of high philosophical philosophy such as a single decision is better than a hundred thoughts in section number 6 or all you have is the sense all you have is the sense of reality in the last section the poem does not seem to be about all those formlessness and meaninglessness if you delve deep into it the poem does throw light into greater aspect of life although very significantly the title is about hymns in darkness the poems the poem in greater part talks about how darkness is more perfect than light i will focus on this aspect later on this darkness is more perfect because in darkness one can keep up the search keep up the search for god keep up the search for his desired object or anything whereas the light marks the culmination of that search that means as soon as as soon as you get the light you end your search your search ends there so light ends your search whereas darkness helps you to keep up the search and this process of search is very important now sujit there is one important critic i find that is sujit s dulai now sujit s dulai has provided a good analysis of the poem in a very structured way how he tries to divide the entire poem into some sections for example in the first four section he sees how the poet has failed to develop properly and in the fifth section he sees how the poet sees if you come to the fifth section 
the poet sees so much light in tot in darkness in total darkness so much courage given beside the abyss why was he forgiven helped comforted if you come to the fifth section here why was he forgiven helped comforted who is the voice of truth that spoke through the imperfect words he has lost faith in himself and found faith at last this fifth section actually is a departure from the earlier four sections as sujit s dulai has argued but the poem might also be a metaphoric description of how a grown up man feels at his existence okay yes how a grown up man feels at his existence let us try and analyze from the first section it's a religio philosophical pondering on man's existence with relation to god in the first stanza for example he says how he here he means the grown up man that man advises humility see he knows how to speak of humility that means he advises humility but he himself fails to maintain that humility without humility as the poet says that means he doesn't know how to maintain that humility by himself but he advises humility now he doesn't do it deliberately he actually does it without any compulsion i mean he has to do it he has to advise and he has to disobey humility himself this is the precarious condition that a grown up man is in now it's not a deliberate attempt as i told you of the grown up man to be not virtuous or wicked but rather it becomes an unshakable feature of being grown up in maturity the follies crowd one's mind replacing the youthfulness this may remind of henry vaughan's metaphysical famous metaphysical poem the retreat where the poet speaks of the glory of childhood and maturity being farther away from god if you read the poem the retreat is a very famous poem and much anthologized poem you will find it everywhere almost everywhere there the poet speaks of how speaks of the glory of childhood and maturity being farther away from god i mean the, the there the poet speaks the the child the, the more the child grows up the more the child gets away from the hello of god however the poet here i mean ezekiel here also seems to say the same thing okay seems to say the same thing what is lost is certain what is gained of dubious value if you look at the first stanza first section what is lost is certain what is gained of dubious value that means one has surely lost the glory of childhood and the maturity that is gained does not confirm certainty of value so one has lost the childhood that is for that is very sure that is very certain but what you have gained does not confirm you surety of values so there is a loss of value also the childhood life was a life of anonymity and the mature life has stunted or halted his pure existence on earth he cannot control the truths truths as he is dipped into religiosity or impurity and hence he does not get peace in his spirit as noise and cacophony of city life disturbs him as the poet states the noise of the city is matched by the noise of his spirit now here also you may say uh, the public comes into uh, the sphere of the private uh, so let us uh, go on that same metaphoric conception of life as farther away from god that same metaphoric conception of life as farther away from god and purity continues into the next stanza i mean next section where deception secrets desires falsehood and such things become very much integral part of life and existence an existence which is played out against the universe which the man or the grown up man tries to manipulate for his own advancement
see the second section here see it's all of little use he is still a puny self hoping to manipulate the universe and all its manifest powers for his own advancement advantages again and again he loses the word of motives self deceived here the lines got somewhat uh, distangled i mean if you read the second section hoping to manipulate the universe and all this is in the same line and the next line is its manifest powers for his own advancement same line and the next line is advantages stop similarly again and again he loses the word of motives this is the line and the next line is self deceived stop uh, this is the problem with the font okay come back to the analysis so this here the poet is talking about an existence which is played out against the universe which the man or the grown up man tries to manipulate for his own advancement the grown up man thinks that he will direct the world he will manipulate the universe as he desires it to be but the endeavor proves to be too little and futile and he loses the word of motives as it is stated is stated he loses the word of motives so the point that man is helpless and pitted against darkness or ignorance or vastness is again underlined coming to the next section that man having no direction or fixity of purpose moves about right here it is stated where is the fixed star of his seeking it multiplies like a candle in the eyes of a drunkard so the man moves about randomly and he finds no pole star in his life the fixed star here in this line in the third section as i told you might imply the pollster which gets multiplied in the eyes of a drunkard and here the drunkard is no other than that grown up man so the grown up man is metaphorically a drunkard a man in his drunken state who doesn't know how to go forward he is directionless he is without any destination that same plight continues in the, into the next stump next section in the fourth section where the man finds himself pressed by destiny or circumstances and the role playing continues that means he is sometimes a disciple he is sometimes a guru he is at times a husband he is at times a father here as the poet says he has played at being disciple he has played at being guru to his wife an impossible husband to his children less than loving now he calls it destiny he names the circumstances a life is a symbolic pattern he is this life he is the interpretation now from this section if we go into the next section there is a there's a kind of shift in tone as that utter hopelessness as that utter utter pessimism find a streak of light a streak of joy a streak of hopefulness so the ordeal of daily life seems to find a streak of life and hope when the poet says in the fifth section so much light in total darkness see if you if you can com compare this line to the thematic to the other to the previous lines of the other sections you will find a difference so much light in total darkness so much courage given beside the abyss the tone and mood also changes as the earlier mood of gloominess as i told you give way to glitter of finding a new way forgiveness finding faith become reachable and achievable the man begins to find hindsight wisdom as it is stated here hindsight wisdom or wisdom that is understood here it is stated stated now he is smug in his hindsight wisdom his follies are familiar accepted like old friends 
So wisdom that is understood late and accepted his follies like his old friends. The portrayal of everyday rea reality in the seventh stanza is a proof of acceptance as his prayers are answered. I mean if you read the seventh section you will find that there is only this a tarred road under a mild sun after rain glowing wet green leaves patterned flat on the pavement around dog seat one ragged slipper near an open gutter three crows pecking away at it and breasts thighs buttocks swinging now, now towards now away from him so this seventh section is actually a portrayal of the humdrum reality a portrayal of the daily daily mundane reality now why is this suddenly a description which is a departure from the philosophical description so far till the sixth section here the poet wants to suggest perhaps that the man has understood his position in the universe the man is now not a man without any direction because the man perhaps tries to find a way forward a direction or how to move about thus from a knowledge of consciousness of being in an apparently irrevocable loss and godlessness to an awareness or consciousness that is that he is not forsaken by God is a transition as I told you in belief. That's why he contemplates the sources of his life. That's why he contemplates the sources of his life. If you read the 8th section here, he is now at the sources of it. Self-love, vanity, throw a sickly light on his gods. And the ninth stanza dwells obliquely on the mystery of creation, how man is created out of a sexual union, the nakedness, soft, warm and round thighs or all those physical descriptions becoming literal references of creative process. See the ninth stanza, that which has to be is being had there, don't, she says, don't. Conniving, conniving all the same. Sort of tearing her clothes. He is using all his force. That means the man is using all his power, all his sexual energy into the creation as he engages her, himself into that process of creation. Wasn't it Blake? who said that the nakedness of woman is the work of God. That means the woman here stands for nature, the beauty of woman, the sexuality of woman is the work of God. If only he could love the bitch. There is one thing to be said for hell. It's a pretty lively place. A man could be happy there. That means a hell where a man could be happy. No, now this hell is not the literal hell. This is perhaps a hell where you will find vibrance of joy. You will find happiness. You will find the happiness of creativity. Now moving on to the next section that is the 10th section the man who was wallowing in the role playing uh, I mean if you read the fourth section he the man is portrayed as a man who plays various roles role role of a disciple role of a guru role of a husband role of a loving father and such things so the man who was wallowing in the role playing in the role playing in earlier stanzas now finds his essence of identity he is not a middle-aged man he is not an old man he is not a married man he is not a professor he is not a journalist and so on here see how the poet describes a man it's often been said 
is simply a man that means essentially a man is a man it is not important whether a, whether a man is a middle aged man whether a man is an is an old man whether a, um, whether a man is a professor whether a man is a journalist whether a man is a married man whether a man is a father whether a man is hus- handsome whether a man is crabbed looking or not these are absolutely not necessary and important what is important is the essential existence of man the godly existence of man now let me read this stent section a man it's often been said is simply a man he is not a middle aged man he is not an old man he is not a married man he is not a man with children he is not a professor or a journalist he is not a foolish man or a wise man he is not tall and handsome or small and crabbed looking he is simply a man and his speech is human the rest is important to understand that speech so what is important is the essential existence of a man on this earth now as i told you what is important is not the role playing but the realization that he is simply a man who if you go to the next section that is section number 11 finds or feels the presence of god in all and everything so there is a there is a clear progress as i told you apparently the poem might seem a poem without any form but the poem does have a form if you read deeply see in the neck in the in the 10th section the poet is talking about the essential importance of a man's existence on earth but in the uh, and in the very next section that is the 11th section the poet is talking about how that man finds or feels the presence of god in all and everything see let me read the enemy is god as the unchanging one all forms of god and the god in all forms the absentee landlord the official of all officials see how the god has been described all forms of god and the god in all forms that means god is omnipresent the absentee landlord the official of all officials is the king of kings the oppressor who worships god and the oppressed who worship god are victims of the enemy they rot in families in castes in communities in clubs in political parties they stay stable they stay still their hands continue to keep down the young yes so the darkness now seems not a gloominess but a perfection because in darkness one can search for something whereas in light as i told you that search ends as one finds his desired object the process of search is a way of perfection that same theme of darkness being better than light continues in the next stanza but the poet meets a man i mean in 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 the in the next section uh, that is section number 13 the poet says that he met a man once who had wasted half his life but that man is cheerful in universal darkness and f- the fact that darkness is better than light is again underlined by the fact that the man had to suffer so much in a single day see the man if you read section number 14 you will find the poet describes that man he said in a single day i am forced to listen to a dozen film song to see a score of beggars to touch uncounted strangers to smell unsmellable smells to taste my bitter native city 
He said, I am forced by the five senses to fear the five senses. I heard him out in black wordlessness. So the poet stands there and the poet listens to that man speaking out his ordeal, speaking out his helplessness, speaking out his pathetic condition on this earth. So in a single day, that man had to suffer all these things. And the poet, standing alone in darkness, saw, I mean, standing alone in light, saw that man in darkness as cheerful, as it is stated towards the end of section number 13. I saw him cheerful, that means the poet, the poet saw him cheerful in the universal darkness as I stood grimly in my little light. So the, 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 poet, the poet stood in light, in his little light. Light is very significantly here stated as little because the light doesn't offer much. And the poet standing in that little light observes that man in darkness and that man in darkness is very much cheerful. So that's how the poem progresses and thematically, thematically speaking also the poem progresses from depicting a man who is utterly helpless, who is directionless, who doesn't know how to find out proper path, now begins to realize the meaning of his existence, the essence of his existence. The poem ends on a realistic tone. As the poet says, if you read the fifth, uh, 15th and the 16th sections, you will find the poet says, You are master neither of death nor of life. This is in the last section, that is the 16th section. You are master neither of death. Here. Sorry. Yes. You are master neither of death nor of life. Belief will not save you nor unbelief. All you have is the sense of reality. This is very, very important. All you have is the sense of reality, which is unfathomable as it yields its success slowly one by one. So what is important is neither belief nor disbelief, but a sense of reality which is unfathomable and therefore unknowable. This reality is not an everyday reality torn apart from the halo of God. But this is a reality which is, in, which is tinged in the shadow of godliness, in the halo of godliness. So you have to understand this reality very well. This is not a mundane reality. This is not a description of earthly reality, not an everyday reality. But this is a reality which is tinged in the halo and shadow of godliness, spirituality, religiosity. So this is how the poem ends. And if you analyze the poem structurally, uh, it also conveys the theme, the theme of spirituality and the theme of having spirit, how to gain spiritual bliss. The poem has long sentences towards the beginning when the man did not know how to be guided by godliness and spirituality. And gradually, as the man finds the mystery, and tries to find a way to be guided by spirituality and godliness, the lines in the poem also become smaller and shorter because the man has got the answer and there is no need of many words. Fewer words can serve the purpose of having godly realization. So when you can realize something, when you have true realization, there is no need of words. There is no need of expression. 
there is only need of realization uh, i think uh, this will suffice you i have tried to analyze the poem uh, but lastly uh, let us have a look at the title which is also uh, very significant uh, you may say the title is pluri significant first there are there are uh, more than one dimension in the title the title is hymns in darkness and as i told you the poem is taken from the collection title hymns in darkness uh, so uh, first you may say it implies the darkness in the title implies literal darkness the darkness in which the poem was written i mean ezekiel used to switch off the lights wh while this poem this poem was being written mm, the poet used to switch off the lights and in his room and in silent darkness cogitated upon the vedic verses that he would rewrite and reorient as i told you in my in one of my earlier lectures that these verses hymns in darkness uh, are actually a reorientation of the vedic verses a sanskrit verses found in the vedas so the darkness in the title may signify the darkness when the poem was being written in a dark silent room while the poet uh, used to switch off all the lights and tried to mull over the poem secondly the darkness is that of darkness is the darkness or confusion of moral or religious values so the darkness in the title may also refer to the confusion or loss of moral or religious values that's why uh, uh, ezekiel doesn't rely on any specific religion rather he drives all religious beliefs and paths into a single unity so he conglomerates he brings into a kind of union all the religious beliefs all the religious paths that exist this is the second meaning third meaning or another another dimension another level that the darkness may play is the darkness which is the binary opposite of light and i think i have referred to it earlier the poem as i told you seems to suggest suggest how darkness is more perfect than light as darkness keeps up the search for something i mean while you are in dark you can keep up the search you continue your search for your desired object for for what you are looking for but as soon as there is light you seem to get that object you seem to get your desired object quite easily and your search culminates there so darkness here is an implication of a continuation of search and in indian philosophy if you if you if you analyze if you understand the indian philosophy uh, india the essence of indian philosophy is seeking you go on seeking you go on seeking god you go on seeking greater spirituality there is no end so light ends that seeking that tendency to seek more and more whereas darkness keeps up that tendency to seek more and more so from that perspective the poem is a true indian poem also as it implies in line with the true indian philosophical tradition the poem implies the tradition of seeking uh, i stop here uh, i have tried to analyze the poem and if you have any pro any any problems any observation you can put forward uh, you can put forward your questions your doubts via email or over telephone thank you